our dear sister from another Mr. Malika. Let's bring her on, Jamie. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Hey. Hello, how you doing? Good, how are you? What's going on? Good, good. good. How you been? You busy, you tired, you feeling good? Because we got a lot of energy, right? We ready to go with you, man. It's all those things at once. Okay, there we go. That's Tired and <laughs> energized. If, that's if good, I'm that's good. Me. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Something like you come highly recommended for my dear brother, Karan Allen. I love him like no other. I'm always on the phone, or I can stay on the phone with that dude all night. But now we got you here tonight. Yeah. So, so Malika, how you feel? What's going on? What you think in the midterm elections? You say now the race is getting a little tight here in New York State. We're going to start with New York for the governor's election here with, between Kathy Holcomb and I don't even want to mention the other guy, but you can mention it. Anybody else on? Well, uh, somebody else can jump in on New York politics because my I'm the senior news and politics editor at Essence Magazine. Oh, and, I, forgot, I forgot to introduce your other part because the technical issues threw me up. Let's tell everybody who you are and what you do. So my name is Malika Javali. I'm the senior news and politics editor at Essence Magazine, and I cover most of our national politics coverage. So whether you're talking about what's going on in Congress, what's going on in the White House, what's going on in some of these competitive races in the Senate, the House of Representatives, that's a lot of what I do. So I guide kind of what that uh, those pieces look like and some of that reporting we also worked on a midterm election hub, which I can get into later. Ooh, ooh. So, so Malika, right, right now, as we go forward, it seems like, and I think I asked everybody this question, it seems like the public in general has really become so deflated between these two parties that it seems like some people have either lost interest or they just have lost trust all around. What are you seeing right now as far as people gearing up? I've all heard my entire life this is the most important election, but it really seems literally the midterms now, everything, historic things are on the ballot. So what are some of the biggest challenges that you're seeing now across the board? In terms of voter enthusiasm or yeah, policy? yeah, and, and some of the and some of the topics because I, I think what's happening here in New York is it, it, it's it's um, a woman's right to choose uh, crime in the economy. Those are the things yeah. that I think I think Democrats are, are are hoping that a lot of young women come and they kind of like flood the polls because of the way their rights have been stricken. And then I think the Republicans feel like the city is unsafe. Mm -hmm. There's record numbers of crime after COVID. And so they're thinking that's what brings the polls. So right now, it seems like the two parties are just vying for votes, but we don't really know if there's action coming. So, you know, across the board, what are you seeing? I think that's always going to be a narrative when it comes to Black people and the elections in terms of voter enthusiasm and trust or lack of trust in our two-party system. I mean, you can go all the way back to the 1960s when Malcolm X was talking about the ballot or the bullet. A lot of that was about the fact that Black people in certain urban neighborhoods did not feel like they really had an ally with the Democratic Party as much as they were courting Black people. And so this is an ongoing narrative. This is an ongoing challenge that I think our two parties have had to contend with when it comes to Black people. So I don't think across the board, we're just like raw, raw, you know, one red and red and blue. I think you do have a contingency of that. But a lot of people have lost trust and faith in both parties. And I can even fast forward to a poll that we do, a scientific poll in essence, it's called the Black, we do it with the Black Women's Roundtable, it's called Power of the Sister Vote. And you'd be surprised because Essence is not necessarily known for having the most radical voices. You know, I come from a tradition of Black radical politics. And so these are not ideas that are beyond the pale, but you have a lot of Black women with a growing uh, like kind of a growing percentage who are saying that they feel like neither party is representing them. Mind you, this was back in March, so I think we should be mindful of that, but I don't think it's insignificant. I do believe that, you know, certain wedge issues, I think abortion is going to be bringing, you know, more women out there, but for the Black women that we polled, and these are, you know, 18 to about 45-year-olds, uh, who comprise, I would say, most of the poll, the economy. When talking about affordable housing, looking at wages, looking at Social Security and health care, those were their top concerns. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, now, do you think, it's just a quick question. Do you think there's going to be an increase or you think a decline in Black voter turnout, male and female? Well, that's actually a little bit hard to say. I think without being on the ground, so a lot of my reporting has been on Black voter enthusiasm and, and the mm. enthusiasm gap, but that has been from me kind of going door to door, 
and doing on the ground reporting and seeing what the temperature is. And it's hard to say what that has been like, I think, especially with COVID, because in some way people weren't really doing the same, you know, we're going out on election day, they're doing absentee ballots, they're doing early voting. So it's a little bit hard to capture. So honestly, it's any, to me, it's anyone's guess. I think unless you're actually going door to door and having these conversations, it's hard to know. Not either one wouldn't surprise me. I'll just yeah. I'll put it that way. If we see an increase, especially in a state like Georgia, I wouldn't be surprised. If we see a decrease, I wouldn't be surprised. Oh. <laughs> yeah, Malika, listen, I, 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 and I'm just going to speak for myself. Um, I feel almost resentful, you know, of um, of um, the, the the current state. I feel as though my uh, my attention is only sought, you know, every few. Every few years, uh, when it's election time, I feel as though that there's very little difference between the two parties in the sense that, you know, I feel like neither one is 100%, um, you know, uh, just 100% honest with me. Um, I, I'm like a lot of people who, uh, and maybe, I don't know if any of this sounds familiar to you, in, 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 you know, in your conversations with people. Um, we, I feel as though I don't really know uh, where, who has a plan or, or, um, and and I'm kind of and I'm kind of disengaged. You know what I mean? I'm very disengaged. I feel very disengaged. I don't feel like it matters which side I vote for. So you know, um, and there are a lot of people. And I, I maybe I'm again maybe I'm I can't speak for everybody. I can speak for myself. You know, um, and 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 now it's just kind of like um, if it's not a if it's not my if it's not my uh, my local elections when it comes to a national level, I just feel as though there's no difference between the two. You know what I mean? Is any, does any of this sound familiar? Or are you hearing anything like that? Or do I sound, you know, like, uh, I don't know, new or something like that? Or what are you hearing this? Yeah, hearing? I, again, I think that is an ongoing uh, concern when it comes to Black people. I do think it's a little different in a a, a lot of times we don't want to believe that Trump really change the course of America, because we've always known that this is a, a country that's rooted in white supremacy, historically built on the backs of enslaved labor on capitalist exploitation. And so, yes, on one hand, this is always what America has been, but I really do think he, his presence and his administration changed the dynamic a little bit where a lot of black people did feel that way in 2020, but when we talk about a lesser of two evils, it were it really was bad. <laughs> you know, that right. 20 what he represented really was bad and brought out some very dangerous elements. Um, to the extent where on my birthday it was disrupted January 6th. And I'm you know, people are seeing oh. an attack. I know, <laughs> of course, that would be my birthday. So I'm, just, <laughs> I'm not trying to look at nothing, it's my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, it, I think it brought out a different level of nastiness to where it's like the conversation isn't really even disagreement between, you know, conservatives and liberals. It is more so having a conversation between folks who are really delusional and you can't even have like a coherent uh, arguments. You can't even have coherent debates because they're in a whole other world. Like they literally think Trump is Jesus. So mm -hmm. how do you you know, how do you combat that? And so I think for a lot of people, they are, they want to get that out regardless. So I think there's enthusiasm, not so much for the Democratic Party, but for the fact that you have this alternate where, which is just so absurd. It's obscene. You know, they're just coming up with complete lies. And so I don't think it's the same, um, I don't think it's the same kind of tone and tenor that it was in 2016 when we had these conversations. I think there are a lot of people who's like, we, we've got to keep them out. And I feel like, unfortunately, that puts that us at a disadvantage because we can't get to those root problems. I think overall, throughout all these decades that Black people have been experiencing economic decline, it's because of capitalism, no matter who's in office. So you're absolutely right about that. No matter who's in office, we're going to have this system that exploits Black labor, that exploits the labor of women, that uh, is going to look for the lowest wages possible. They're going to offshore jobs. So that's going to happen regardless of who's the president. But a lot of these local fights where you see kind of these QAnon conspiracy theories, that's happening on a local level. And I do think people are, are a little bit more enthusiastic about that. Let, let me ask you this. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, one question was about voter suppression, like, especially in Georgia. The race is kind of it's kind of it's tight in the governor's race and with uh, Senator Warlock. What what can people do to like right now? Though they're going to arrest people, you give them water, all kind of crazy stuff out there now. They even in Florida, they looking at people that came home from prison that voted. They locking them up. What can people do to safeguard their vote in their local state during this time? There are groups that uh, help protect that. So, for instance, I live in, or I'm, I'm based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm from Georgia originally. But Milwaukee is also, I would say Wisconsin as a whole, is also one of those uh, kind of swing state, bellwether states, where what happens there ha kind of controls what happens uh, on a national level. Mm -hmm. And I shadowed a voter organization that protected the poll. So there are groups out there. I think, you know, you just, you have to find out who they are, but they are guarding to make sure that there's not going to be that kind of intimidation, that they're not going to be susceptible to the, the kinds of like really the undermining of democracy that a lot of the right wing has been engaged in lately. And I just to shout out the group that I shadowed in Wisconsin, they're called Black, Black, Black Leaders Organizing Communities. Um, and so they've got people on the ground. Like I, I shadowed some of these workers who were looking to make sure that nothing nefarious was going on at the polls. You, you know something? I, I'm really concerned. Um, and I really thought there was going to be a different presence with our VP in the White House um, in this administration. And it has been, I, I, I'm hearing two different sides. There's one segment of our population that feels that she hasn't done hasn't used her position or platform to help the community like they thought. And then there's another side that feels like if you are critical of her, then you're kind of um, uh, a turncoat, so to speak. I the, the administration doesn't feel strong to me. I, mm -hmm. I, 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 I was wondering if it was more so a stop gap of just getting Trump out, which I was in favor of. But um, I, I think she was kind of relegated to the border I think that was kind of the thing that she's going to come and deal with. But now in New York, we're getting buses here regularly, you know, as a sanctuary state. And I mean, this, this, this has gotten so chaotic. We're already to the hilt um, as far as homeless people and things like that. So we're in a lot of trouble. But do you think the the, the image of the VP, because when Obama came in, I mean, I mean, we were just, I know I was head over heels and I thought this would possibly lead to the first, not only the first female president, the first black female president, because I was just thinking of the age of the sitting president. I didn't think he would actually, you know, go for another term. And because of his age, I thought there was still a chance maybe he wouldn't have finished this one just because of age or health or anything like that. Um, so as far as the VP is concerned, do you think there's a strength to this party? Because I'm worried. What was the last line you said? Do you think there's a strength to the party? Because I'm worried. I thought she would be the person that would come and galvanize the party. I don't see her. I because literally never see her. And, that, and his, historically, VPs weren't seen. You know, they weren't seen back in the day. They would just be around the world doing different things. But I thought she was the strength of this party. And it looks like they're trying to bury her, in, unless I'm uh, perceiving it wrong. Well, I just want to add to, to Kelvin's question, too, so you can answer them both. Because when I talk to people about the VP, a lot of people feel that her purpose has already been served, was just basically to help win the election. When I talk to, you know, Black people or family members or friends, I a lot of people say that. But go ahead. You can answer the question. I, I actually agree with that, Rodney. Uh, I think... It was a matter of kind of transactions. And unfortunately, we deal with a lot of transactional politics. I think mm -hmm. people thought that the end of the story was really and the end of the transaction was to just get a black woman in a, in a high place because, Correct. hey, we brought Joe Biden. We're bringing you the vote. Give us a black VP. And so I think that is part of the problem with a lot of the way that we organize and view politics as a people, which it, it tends to just be these kinds of transactions, but nobody was, was really asking about, well, what is, exactly is the power of the vice president? Because then I think some people's expectations would be tempered. What right. policies can she actually enact? Correct. Uh, can she be a tiebreaker? And, and, and in one sense, she does have that because she still, you know, is a, she's a part of the Senate body. And so she can 
break those ties, but what policies is she has she campaigned on? So would she be willing to vote a certain way if she's going to be the tiebreaker in the Senate? And unfortunately, a lot of us, um, and I, you know, I just I gotta put a spotlight on my women for a little bit. It was just we just want to see a black woman up there. And that was the end of the story. We're good to go. Mm-hmm. So if we treat politics as just this thing where we get symbolic gestures, this is what we're gonna get. Well, she yeah. did help the Asian crime bill, though. She got that passed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I kind of feel that when you know, like when I have conversations with people, I do a lot of listening first because I need to determine how much you actually know about politics. Because if you don't know that much, you're not understanding why certain things are happening the way they are. And a lot of things are optics, they're just perception. And like you said, a lot of people don't understand like what is the purpose of the vice president. They don't have an understanding of that. Do you find that to to be an issue too that a lot of African-Americans truly don't understand politics? I think in in a formal sense, not entirely. I think that there are some instinctive things that we get. I think a lot of Black folks know um, the policies that are hurting our communities. We know the policies that we need. We know that through a three a two party system that we probably need an independent voice. And a lot of us just kind of resign ourselves to the fact that this is just what we have to do because it's going to be hard to break to become independent. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when it comes on like a civics lesson type of level. I think that's just a a function of our kind of American system in general. I think a lot of people don't recognize, you know, why we have the certain amount of, you know, House of Representatives reps that we have, why we have the amount of senators that we have. Oh, shit. What was... (laughs) Yo, what was... My mom was trying to bend over and be discreet. Oh. (laughs) Say hello to her. Hey, mom. What up, mom? What up, mom? What up, mom? But she's wearing, you know, those little cozy clothes. So she's like a little bear behind me. <laughs> There's no sweat. We'll probably get a treat from me at some point. And for the Mom, next I'll do that. No, no, no. 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 Give, give me a fair warning, Marke. He has a white man that lives with him. So if you see a white man, it's not the clan trying to sneak up on him on live. So <laughs> how, you, how you know it's him? He has his push. Pajama shirt tucked in his pants. That's how you know it's that. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask you? Can I ask you a question? Uh, it's been a while since, um, you know, the fact that your essence, and as we obviously know the history of essence. So give us a little because I haven't really thought much about essence in a while, and so it was good to hear you say that. I know it's a bit highly respected. Um, and I, I, I hope it's translating to a younger generation because many of us grew up. Uh, in barber shops, and I'm sure in the salons had essence and ebony and all the different things like that. So, where are you yeah. all at today? Yeah, how is it translated uh, to to recent times right now? Uh, the the marketing, the messaging. Well, a lot of it, uh, I think, media overall has gone more digital. So we've enhanced our Twitter presence, we've enhanced our Instagram presence. So I have initiated, I pitched and executed a midterm voter hub. So it's geared towards black women for the midterm elections because Essence has a black woman audience, but it's really helpful for anybody. So we have really enhanced kind of our digital footprint. Uh, The voter hub is called Paint the Pulse Black. So if you go to essence.com slash paint the pulse black, we did a voter guide looking at some of the most competitive and notable races in the country. And you get to see, we asked about a dozen, I'm gonna say about a dozen candidates, what their issues are that relate to Black people. So if we're talking about affordable housing, if we're talking about healthcare, what are you doing as it relates to Black people f- with those issues? And so you, it's like, a, it's a really cute. Like we've got some video on there. So we've got a whole social team that's uh, behind promoting this voter hub. So yeah, oh, that's, that's excellent. a little bit of what we're doing. Congratulations. That's excellent. So I love it. Your, let me ask you a question. So I'm going back, I'm going to the Herschel Walker thing. When you talk to Black conservatives, what are they saying? What do they see in Herschel Walker will make them say, you know what? He should represent my state. Uh, well, I haven't talked to a lot of Georgia conservatives. Um, I will say when I, and I, this may not be a fair comparison. It may be a completely fair comparison. When I think about, he reminds me a lot of a Donald Trump where they just come up with. Get you know, out of like, here. You serious? 
<laughs> no <laughs> way. Well, now that's not the part. That's not well, the part I was gonna. That's not the part. Having a having pay for abortions, don't say anything over his head, don't have no facts. No <laughs> way, Donald Trump. <laughs> so that's not, that's not the kicker, though. So I don't want y'all to get mad at me. But I remember reporting at barbershops or a barbershop when I was in uh, when I was first on the ground in Milwaukee. And Milwaukee, if y'all don't know, has a ton of black people. It's like oh, yeah. 30, oh, yeah. oh, 30 to 40 percent black. So yeah. let me talk to some brothers and see what they have to say about this election. And a number of them said that they just like Trump because he was straight up. You know, he's telling it like it is like he's going to save us some money. Um, you know, <laughs> with none of the Democrats. So it was almost just like reactionary. Like, I don't mess with the Democrats, so let me just go to Trump. And he's like, funny. Um, so like very sort of superficial reasons. And I feel like Herschel Walker has the same kind of presence and demeanor. Like I'm, I'm watching some of the commercials out here and he's not saying nothing. But the fact that, you know, he's got this bravado and he was a football player and he's like, I'm Herschel Walker and I want to save babies and I'm Herschel Walker and Raphael he Warner. He was saving babies. Shit, he, he uh, slaughtered a few of them. He slaughtered a few of them. Well, oh, yeah, no. that's the hypocrisy because he, he'll say <laughs> that he's all about family values and then we see what's going on but, behind the scenes. But it's the same thing in the Latino community, Latino men. Like, what's the, the census? They like those most cheese most yeah. I'm saying that word right. They like those kind of guys but these the most ignorant people in the world. They walk around like you know what I'm saying. I don't get why they so in love with those type of people. I don't get it. You, the, the, the culture. Yeah, there you go, D. You just said it. It's a culture. What I used to notice to like when I was in the police department, it wasn't that they were educated about what was really going on. They were already in a culture, and this is what was going on in the culture. So they just go along with it. You know what I mean? It's not that they're educated about it all, because if you listen to them when they talk, she what she's saying is actually true. You're just saying superficial things, but you're not really looking at, is he really doing anything for you? Has your life changed as a result of this person being in this position? You know what I mean? So when someone comes and talks to them that's educated about it, they wind up looking really stupid. Yeah. Mal Malika, what, what uh, brought you to this career field? What, what led you, 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 you seem like a very young woman into, oh, it, it's so, you. you're welcome. <laughs> it, it, it seems so hard to get younger people interested in politics from a career choice. Mm -hmm. So many people have been disenchanted. So uh, give us a little bit about your, your um, academic background, where you came from, where you went to school at, and then what led you here, what, what inspired you to, sure. to take this path? Well, uh, growing up in Atlanta, I actually grew up in an activist household that was rooted in this idea of, you know, Black self-determination. So I was a part of a group called the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement growing up here in Atlanta, and they had other kind of branches, but it, it came from this Black movement that started in Detroit with Black folks who said, okay, we need to find an alternative system to capitalism. We need to have an alternative to this sort of integrated approach that the civil rights movement has brought us to. So it came out a lot of that, it came out of that Black power, Black nationalist movement, and they migrated. They came to the South, they spread to Los Angeles, and that's the movement that I grew up in. So I, I was birthed into it. I almost didn't really have a choice, uh, but I didn't have to stay with it. And I think a lot of what kept, what resonated with me and what uh, made it apply to my life really was an academic choice. Uh, I had a good friend of mine who became an African-American studies major when I was in undergrad. And she kind of convinced me to do it. And it really changed my life because I saw the connections, like the things that I heard when I was young and I didn't really process. I began to process when I was reading the academic text, when I was reading the scholarship, when I was reading how slavery came from capitalist exploitation and racism came from slavery. So you put two and two together, we probably wouldn't have the kinds of race issues we have if we didn't have a economic system that benefited from African labor and relied on you know, oppressing Black people and creating stereotypes about Black people. So that all kind of congealed for me, I would say, when I was an undergrad. And at that moment, I knew I wanted to do, I wanted to have a career that did something that was dedicated to Black people. Whatever it was, <laughs> I knew I wanted to be that. So I kind of did a few different things. Um, but to me, journalism and writing was a way to blend a little, a little bit of everything that I like. Because, you know, we get to write, we get to be creative, but we also get to deal with policy. 
And I actually met Karan through some of that political work several years ago now when I, I did live in Brooklyn. I lived in East New York for a period of time and I lived in Brooklyn for outside of Atlanta. That's where I spent you know most of my adult life. Actually, that's where I spent most of my adult life, period. But it's the second most you know where I've spent my life in general. Well, first of all, you lived in East New York. Uh, thank you for your service. Oh, 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 no, I'm, no I, I'm sorry. It's, Go something ahead, it's, a, it's something in the East New York water. They, they breed radical people in East New York. Water. Something they like do. something like that. But I, I, how did I forget this whole chapter of my life? I went to New York because I went to law school. So okay. I'm a, uh, I was a practicing attorney in New York for many years. But just looking at the law and writing the law was not that interesting to me. So I would spend weekends and nights finding stories. And I would go to Milwaukee. I worked on a short film while I was still working full time. And I was like, you know what? I need to find a way to just do this entirely. And I was able to finally make the transition. Nice. Nice pivot. I got, I got, a, I got a question for you. So they will say like last time the black women saved the Democratic Party. Will they save the Democratic Party again this time? And what will the Democratic Party owe them? And do you think they will pay up for what the, uh, what they come to the table and say, you owe us this? No. Okay, we'll not get 2024. <laughs> Ronnie said no. Ronnie say no, no <laughs> deal. And for the last since I've been alive, they've been, they haven't they haven't paid. Hey, listen, no listen. That, com that, that commercial said no, no vote, no, no, no. You know, chill, chill. Okay, you are gonna get a scroll. I, I got a scroll. You, 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 Malika, did you see that, that one with saucy? Saying we that have one? a guess. We have a you guess. I'm that. asking the sister. Did she see the, 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 the scroll? Oh. I don't know what you're talking about. The yeah, she doesn't is, know. They, the scroll is when somebody says that it's something inappropriate. I wasn't gonna say oh. anything appropriate. So okay. he's getting close though. No. <laughs> did you see, did you see the thing with um it said no no vote and no Oh you know? oh yeah, yeah see, see, oh, see. You're talking about, I'm you not gonna give me the scroll. I'm she was, to say she was trying free. to block that out, D that she no, didn't you just see kept it. drilling, you just kept drilling, man. Ooh, walk it like a <laughs> talk it. Come on, talk it. <laughs> but I know what you're talking about. I I think it's also important to kind of step back to and say which black woman made those demands. I think there were some black women who um, <clears throat> did that, that kind of grassroots organizing. I think there were some black women who felt like the Democratic Party was never going to speak to them. So in Georgia, you saw higher voter turnout. In some states like Wisconsin, you didn't. And again, this is where it's the major city, Milwaukee, is 40 percent black. And voter turnout was still a struggle, even with Trump being the president or, you know, being on the ballot. So in some cities, it was like that. But unfortunately, a lot of black women who are engaged are the ones who feel like there's something to lose, who already kind of have a higher, I would say, socioeconomic status. And for a lot of Black women who feel like there is nothing left to lose because they've lost a lot of it already. They might have, you know, lost their jobs in the pandemic. They were trying to get those $2,000 checks, but then the Democrats said, we already gave you a $2,000 check. And they're like, what? <laughs> Why y'all gaslighting me? There's a lot of Black women who feel like there is nothing left to be gained because they have, they've suffered from so much loss for so long. Um, so for those Black women who are doing kind of well and they're engaged in the process, Sure, they might get something out of it, but for the average everyday black woman worker, your guess is as good as mine. Hey, wow. you, you know, if you don't mind, I want to circle back to something that Kelvin said earlier uh, with regard to Kamala Harris. He said uh, basically we 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 haven't really heard from her, right? She kind of she feels like almost like she's been tucked away or something. You know what I mean? She's on the she's on the back of a milk cart and she's missing. Yeah, yeah, like somebody just kidnapped her or something. I'm I'm actually thinking that maybe maybe she's been tucked away for a reason. You know, um Biden is not polling so well right now from what I understand. All right. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's a sort of a thing where they're kind of keeping some of the stink off of her maybe for a possible run uh at the presidency later on. What do you think? Do you think anything that this maybe that sounds Possible or, or, or plausible? That's an interesting theory. I think it is plausible. Uh, I will say uh, that she isn't quite tucked away. Like she's been on a tour of the last month or so going to some major cities. I know she was in Buffalo for a time, but she's actually on a midterm election tour. So she's not tucked away per se, but whether there is enough press about what she's doing is kind of the other question. And I think with so much else going on in the world, Kamala Harris going on a multi-state tour is not going to get as many eyeballs when we've got school shootings and we've got, 
you know, Biden making some of his announcements and you have Republicans making all kinds of wild statements <laughs> in debates. Um, so I, I wouldn't necessarily say that this is strategic because she is in the public's eye, but it's just not necessarily getting a lot of media attention. Wow. Wow. I'm, 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 I'm really, really, you know, there were, there were certain people, you know, we talked about on the show and, and first of all, I don't want anybody to think that I'm, um, knocking our VP. Um, I remember her being a flamethrower and, the VP position doesn't really afford you the opportunity to do that. You know, she has a really, really, you know, a really, a really tough punch. And so now it just seems like, because I'll be honest with you, I couldn't see her. I, I thought this would be a natural progression to her taking that next step and running. I don't see it now. I don't know. The administration seems bland to me. Mm -hmm. and, and and one of my friends, she always tells me, she said, you need to read what they're doing. They're doing things. They're just not messaging right. Mm -hmm. They're getting certain things done, and I just, I don't see it. I really can't get a feel for 2024. I'll be honest with you. I had, At one point, I said, the people running for 2024 are not in this administration. I mm -hmm. can't see Biden running again. Mm -hmm. I just can't. I, I'm wondering, where are the, that's why I'm, I reference you being a young person who is into politics. Why is it that we cannot get young people in this arena. I mean, look at it. Uh, Trump is 70-something, right? Biden's 70-something. Hillary was 68 or something when she ran. I mean, where are the young people at? That they, I don't know if people realize this is going to affect their future, but only older people seem to vote. Only older people seem to get involved. You young put, people seem you like put, they, they've turned their back. You got to put weed in the ballot. <laughs> well, I think, I think the look of activism is just a little bit different. It may not look like mm -hmm. traditional politics. I mean, I get pitches right. all the time from folks who are with the Movement for Black Lives, for instance, uh, which is an organization that has been creating the kinds of legislation that we probably should see pass in Congress. So people, I think, are flocking more to grassroots organizing. I see people flocking towards mutual aid. People are going towards more local uh, arenas, and that might be a, a wise decision. If you think about what presidential administrations have been able to accomplish, it's, it's massive, but does it really bring a lot of progress, I think, is the question. When you consider the fact that Black people now have their housing uh, rates have declined to what they were in 1968. When you look at the, uh, the fact that the millennial wealth gap is larger than it was for our parents, larger than it was for our grandparents. So what, you know, I, I think the question is, why haven't we had a national politics that attracts young people? Why have we had a national politics that tends to be so much at a standstill where barely little can even pass in Congress, even little baby tiny things? You, you had a massive movement of young people who took to the streets two years ago, and then that got deflated because we couldn't even get the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act passed. So what is, I guess, the wisdom of getting into politics on a national level when you see these are the results? So I think young people are getting involved, but in a different way. And, you know, and not to um, valorize young folks, because on the other hand, a lot of a lot of folks are distracted and in debt and struggling. <laughs> so it's like, I gotta worry about right. the student loan bills. I can't right. shell out money for a campaign. That's a lot. <laughs> that's a right. lot of time, that's a lot of energy. And I need to work so I can pay the bills. Well, like, so, are you gonna make an announcement tonight? Is there, is, are you, cause I think that's what people ask me. Whenever I'm in the streets, they, is my life <laughs> running? That's what the word on the street is. Like, is there something that you're going to announce tonight that you are going to throw your hat in the political ring? Okay. We want to hear it right now. I'm giving you the floor. Go ahead, Malika. Let the people know because they are all watching. You know, you know, politicians, they know how to be evasive. So that's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> 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 that, was that question. I'll, I'll give that a, well, a thought. Well, well, you have my vote either way. Yeah, you, you, have you, way. You, you have, have my vote. You, you have our financial support on that one, man. So <laughs> you do get in there. But Malika, we want to we respect the time and everything. Thank you for coming out. How can people get in touch with you? Are you on Instagram? Are you on Twitter, Facebook? What is it? How can people get at you? I'm on all the things. So y'all see my name right there. That's my name on Twitter. Uh, that's my name on Facebook. And on Instagram, it's M-I-S-S -S Jabali. 
And please check out our voter hub. I think it's really dope. We direct people to uh, how they can, well, some places you still might be able to register, some you may not, um, but we direct people to some great voter content, all of our midterm election coverage, um, and to get to know some of the candidates who are running in races that we may not be familiar with. There's like Sherry Beasley in North Carolina, for instance, who may flip the state blue. There's some district attorney races on there. So that's essence.com slash paint the polls black. And Malika got a blue check mark on Instagram. I just followed you. Go ahead, girl. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute, D. We're forgetting <laughs> one final question, D. Oh, yeah. Malika, got to find out. This, is your, this is your hardest question of the night. Yeah. Be careful. Who's the top five rappers of all time? Top five rappers? See, this I'm not All time, not now. All time. All, all, all time. This, this, all this, this, time. I'm about to get canceled. Okay. Um. <laughs> now you ain't Kanye okay. now. God damn. <laughs> he who shall not be named. Um. Come on, you no. can do it. I'm gonna, go with, I'm gonna go with real easy ones. So I'll say. I'll start say, with the five. Start with your fifth one. Fifth start with the fifth one. Oh, that's a good one. Hold on, let me think. Mm -hmm. I gotta do my logic. So that's kind of tough, though. I'm from Georgia, so Andre is definitely. Andre three thousand. Go ahead. That's probably yeah. in the four or five range. Yeah. Okay. I would give, and this is some nostalgia. I would put Nas in the in the three four range. Okay. okay. I would put Biggie in the yes. two okay. range. Okay. Okay. Tupac, he actually comes from the Malcolm X grassroots movement, like I did. So he's probably overrated. Gonna overrated. Guy. Overrated. Overrated. Go ahead. I mean, I will, that's what, that's what the contradictive. Poster. Go ahead. Go I see the Biggie poster in the back. Uh, but <laughs> Tupac is like one two for me. I, I named four people. Yeah, yeah one more. Yeah, one more. You lived in Brooklyn, baby, baby. She said that already. She said, she said that. that. Mm -hmm. she did. You know where she going? Yeah, I know where she going. going. She say said, well, don't, don't, don't tell you that. Don't tell you that. She might just say okay. MC Hammer. Let her go. <laughs> <laughs> I almost did. I say Jay Z already? No, no you did not say. Jay -Z. I knew it was coming. That's what I said. It, it was coming. Jay Z. Man, All right. I said it was coming. But like, thank All you right. again for coming yeah. on, Chopper. We know we took up a lot of your time, but we love small people. We're talking about small people we like to keep on for a long time. So thank you. Get some rest. Tell mommy good night. We love her too. <laughs> And we want some of that sweet potato pie for Thanksgiving. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for Thank having you so me. much. 